So I want to cover the Protestant Reformation in the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, and so this ties into that story with, with the Netherlands, uh, but then is the counterpart of what's going on in England. And in England, of course, we know England is an island. I hope we, we have that picture in mind, and maybe I should start there. Uh, I don't have that in my outline, but uh, that might be a good place to start is, uh, uh, let's see. All right, so, um, Now, if I pull up Google Earth here, uh, and of course, here's Long Beach. Okay. And if we go over here, England, uh, and, and when I talk about England in this lecture, we're talking about the southern part of England. Uh, the northern part is Scotland. And then Ireland is a separate island all into itself. Uh, but notice here between uh, modern day Belgium and uh, England off of Bristol here, it's a very short, um, it's a very short distance uh, between there. This is like the distance between uh, Long Beach and Catalina, you know, um, it's not uh, that far. And uh, the Netherlands now today are, is this region, but in the time period we're talking about, even what is modern day Belgium was at times part of the Netherlands. And of course, you know, we're dealing with the late medieval era and there's lots of uh, minor princes, uh, dukes going to war with one another and changing the map in all sorts of ways. And so, um, we're seeing the, the emergence of this. Uh, and, and okay, I think that but that's uh, helpful. Amsterdam is, is good to know about. Antwerp is a, a city that comes up a lot. Uh, Calais is, is modern day France, but, um, but is, uh, again, also part of this contended sort of area that was at times part of Spain, at times part of France, at times part of the Netherlands, and going back and forth. Um, all right, and maybe, you know, maybe some other things will come up as well. But we have, uh, of course, Germany, and Germany is basically where the Holy Roman Empire was centered uh, but then the Holy Roman Empire, as I showed before, goes down into the middle part of Italy. Um, and then France. Now France, the modern day borders of France are pretty much the way that France has always been with the borders, you know, on the fringes changing. Uh, but um, it's kind of like something that stays the same. And of course, England stays very much the same throughout this period. Um, okay. I think that's good for now. All right. So uh, we have the Protestant Reformation in the Holy Roman Empire. Okay, basically what we think of as modern day Germany going through Switzerland down into Italy. Um, <clears throat> and we have uh, the story begins with Charles the Bold of Burgundy and what he does uh, is to unify a lot of smaller uh, provinces and duchies uh, into one unified contiguous geographic region. Uh, which then is considered like the state of of Burgundy as a state, uh, as an independent um, political entity. 
but notice that it's sandwiched between the Holy Roman Empire and France. Okay, so, uh, and then this has a lot to do with our, with our story. Right. And um, because Burgundy is sandwiched in between France and the Holy Roman Empire, uh, the Burgundy Wars break out and uh, in these wars, uh, Charles the Bold uh, dies on the battlefield. And then those, um, that state of Burgundy is then divided between France, the kingdom of France, which is sort of imperial in scale and the Habsburg empire. Uh, and the Habsburg empire is named after the house of Habsburg. So you have all these nobles who have all these pretty high titles all throughout Europe. And um, so Burgundy, including those Netherlands, which were once separate from Burgundy, are now inherited by the Habsburg family. Okay, and then of course, this is about the time of Columbus's invasion of the Americas, which I talked about before, um, Machiavelli, Moore's Utopia. So we're just coming out of the 15th century uh, or yeah, in the 15th century into the 16th century. And then most of what we want to talk about um, uh, in terms of the Reformation occurs within the 16th century. And it's a little bit of a long story, uh, but there's a lot of sort of uh, there's, there's some just some key points that may help to kind of clarify what's going on. And I also want you to be thinking about feudalism, as I discussed it before, and the feudal order of things. And now we're going to think about class structure and how feudal class structure uh, plays into this kind of deterioration, this, this final decline of the feudal order. I talked about the decline of the feudal order before. Here's where this is the end of the story for feudalism and how feudalism ends, at least in a couple of places. It's not entirely over. Okay, there's a, there's a longer story and I'll, I'll touch upon that later. But, but I just want to use this as kind of an example, like two examples of how feudalism came to an end. Um, okay, so uh, Martin Luther uh, publishes his 95 theses in 1517. He is a Catholic priest, but he has some problems theologically with the Roman Catholic Church. And he publishes these, these uh, theses or these critiques, these claims of his against standard Roman Catholic uh, doctrine uh, in a document. And it's sort of a, you know, it's an invitation. This is not something that Martin Luther made up to create a list of theses and, and publish them. Uh, this is a convention of theologians at the time, and it was intended to invite debate. And then, you know, maybe he's right, maybe he's wrong. Okay, whatever. But it causes a big uproar. Um, and just about this time is when Charles of Habsburg, uh, of the Habsburg house, the Habsburg family um, begin, uh, becomes Holy Roman Emperor. In 1506, this is before Martin Luther uh, comes on the scene, Charles is already the Duke of Burgundy, which is that map that I showed you just previously. And then he becomes the King of Spain. And so we've talked about Charles as King of Spain uh, in earlier lectures. Okay, so this is the same Charles. Okay. And, um, and then he is Holy Roman Emperor from uh, 1519 until he begins to abdicate his titles in 1556. Okay, so um, in 1521, we have the Diet of Worms. So as Holy Roman Emperor, Charles um, uh, 
periodically there would be scheduled diets. Uh, these are these are meetings, like almost like a calling of parliament, which I'll discuss later in relation to to uh, England. But it's more in the feudal style of calling a, a parley to talk with all the the leading. Uh, political princes and discuss policy and figure out how the empire is going to be run at a, at a larger scale. And for Charles as emperor to get input from his vassals, his, especially his higher up vassals, and to address certain, you know, empire wide controversies. And of course, in 1521, the big controversy was Martin Luther and his 95 theses. So that was part of what Charles wanted to discuss here. And so he, he, the, he invites Luther to defend, uh, to give a speech defending his 95 theses, uh, sort of condense it into a lecture. And um, in light of that uh, defense, Charles issues the Edict of Worms, uh, and Worms is a city. So diet is like a, is, is like a, like a staging, like, you know, the king would sit on the diet and then people would come, it's an it's a audience with the emperor. And the city is called Worms um, in, in Germany. Um, so the Edict of Worms uh, in that Charles declares that Luther is a heretic, and he doesn't agree with his theology, and he outlaws the propagation of Luther's ideas. Now he did promise that Luther would be safe in coming to the Diet of Worms uh, so he does not arrest him, he lets him go, but then basically after that, after he offers him safe passage out of the city, uh, Martin Luther himself is outlawed, <laughs> and anybody could just pick him up and bring him in to be arrested. Um, and so Luther goes into hiding, uh, but he is supported by some some. Um, uh, dukes and princes throughout the Roman Ho uh, Holy Roman Empire. And, um, and he also is supported by some knights. Now knights, if you recall from my earlier discussions are, you know, they're a lower level within the, the vassalage sort of hierarchy. And they're not, um, they're not really nobles in the clearly defined sense. They're like on their way to becoming nobles, uh, but they do have like a fiefdom that they can exploit, uh, landed property that they can exploit for profit. And, um, and they have a lot of autonomy and, and they are somewhat like a small prince in the sense that Machiavelli talks about. Uh, but at this time, the feudal order is falling apart. And um, a couple of these knights uh, Franz von Sickingen and Ulrich von Hutten, um, they are quite active in trying to uh, address their political concerns as, as the position of knights is kind of becoming obsolete. Uh, Sickingen is actually sometimes called the last knight. Uh, and, you know, and then he, he got involved in some very uh, unscrupulous, you know, he was just involved in the normal thing that knights did, which was not all chivalrous, like, you know, in the fairy tales. Um, he would kidnap princes and then hold them for ransom. And that's how he made most of his money, um, by getting ransoms for uh, wealthy princes and, and, their, and their families and using that as leverage to extract uh, ransoms. And that was just considered a normal thing. Uh, Ulrich von Hutten was uh, similarly a knight, uh, but he was also a humanist. He was well educated, and um, and he was attracted to Luther's ideas. Uh, but they're they're but they're they weren't primarily Protestants. Their main goal was that they wanted re religious freedom um, for the general popula populace and to end serfdom. Because by doing that, they could really, uh, they could accomplish something on the behalf, especially of townspeople who were largely Protestant, and free serfs from serfdom, you know, because serfdom was kind of being phased out anyway. 
And they were thinking that if they could do this on behalf of these other class classes of people, that they could create a unified coalition then to help um, position knights as a class in a, in a better position within the declining feudal order. All right, uh, hold on one second for me. I gotta let my cat in, he's crying at the door. <laughs> hey buddy, come on. Yeah. All right, um, and so what these, these guys do, uh, Sigigan and Hutton, is they launch a revolt against the Holy Roman Empire, uh, a very short-lived revolt, uh, but a serious, um, you know, these are trained uh, soldiers, uh, so it was significant, although, you know, they didn't get very far, uh, but it was a serious threat. Um, and then just the next year, then there's a widespread uh, peasant out, outbreak of revolts all throughout the Holy Roman Empire. And um, this war is led by Thomas Munster, Munster, sir, Munster um, and um, he's a theologian and he's inclined towards Luther's ideas. Um, and he's trying to, you know, um, awaken a, a religious revival in the peasantry. And this leads to armed revolt, but, you know, we have peasants, these are country people, serfs and other poor people, mostly in the countryside who are not well equipped or well trained or um, uh, have good communication or logistics. And so they're basically slaughtered somewhere around 200,000, maybe up to 300,000 uh, peasants are slaughtered in this, uh, but it's, uh, but it goes on for quite a while and, and it's quite widespread. So that's, uh, you know, a big sign of the uproar that Lutheran uh, ideas uh, sparked in the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, the next diet is the Diet of Augsburg in 1530. Um, there may have been another diet in between there, but, uh, but this is one of the scheduled diets. And, and this is where uh, Luther um, and his compatriots now, so there's a group of theologians around Luther, um, uh, come to defend Lutheranism again and they present to Charles the Augsburg Confession, which is a document describing their theology uh, in, in uh, a more condensed uh, form than, than previously. And the Augsburg Confession is still used by the Lutheran Church uh, as one of their foundational uh, documents. This is rejected by Charles. He still considers them heretics and outlaw. And, um, and in the wake of the uh, Diet of Augsburg, the Schmalkaldic League, um, which is a league of Protestant princes and dukes of these, um, of these uh, provinces and fiefdoms, uh, they form a league, they form an alliance and, and, um, and declare that, that they're willing to defend Luther and his ideas against the emperor. Charles does not react. He negotiates a truce with the league and he suggests diplomatically that they wait for the ecumenical council uh, of the Catholic church to decide the issue. The ecumenical council is delayed and delayed and delayed for quite a while. So uh, in the meantime, there's the Diet of Regensburg um, and Charles advertises this at least in part as a debate on the Augsburg Confession. But what actually happens is 
before the debate starts, uh, a document is produced by Charles's diplomats and some Catholic clergy in consultation with the Lutherans. Um, but it's really produced by Charles's people and it's called the Regensburg book, which is um, a diplomatically worded sort of version of L Lutheranism that is deliberately worded in such a way as to create some kind of compromise, something that everybody could agree to, maybe but everybody doesn't get exactly what they want, but at least it kind of gets in the direction of creating some sort of form of religion that everybody could agree to, the Catholics and the Lutherans, okay. But it's rejected by both sides. Okay, so that's a big failure. Um, and then just a few years later, we have the Council of Trent, and this is really the launching of a counter-reformation. And I talked about this a little bit uh, before in relationship to the Jesuits who become a big part of this. And, and of course the Jesuits were just formed uh, shortly before this. Uh, but this is where the Roman Catholic Church tries to take back the culture war, as we might call it today. And, um, uh, and, and, and the Counter-Reformation is somewhat successful, but really it, but more successful outside of the Holy Roman Empire than within it. Um, so as the Council of Trent is still meeting on a periodic basis, the Schmalkaldic War breaks out. And I'm looking at it in this long durée sort of fashion. So I'm, I'm sort of gathering together what are sometimes considered separate events as part of one long story of this Schmalkaldic War from the Schmalkaldic League. Um, and so the Schmalkaldic League you know, leads the first revolt. Um, they're defeated very quickly. Um, in uh, in fifteen forty seven, uh, I think I don't have this date. I wanted it to go a little longer because I'm really continuing on up until the Peace of Oxford, the settlement of Oxford. So to fifteen fifty five. So I really want this to be till 1555, and I'll fix that later. But um, but the first Schmalkaldic War is from 1546 to 1547. The League is defeated pretty handily, but in the northern part of the Holy Roman Empire, they have some some successes. So it's not as a ultimate defeat as as it could have been. Uh, and it does work propagandistically to spread the ideas of Lutheranism. So, um, you know, Charles is, is kind of losing the battle of ideas, even though he's winning the war on, on, on the real battleground. Um, he issues the Augsburg Interim at the Diet of Augsburg, the next Diet at Augsburg, and Augsburg is a city. Um, that's where the Augsburg thing comes from. And it orders Protestants to readopt Catholic theolo theology. So it's saying you can't, you can't have Protestant Lutheran theology. You have to think the way I think uh, and, the, and the Pope thinks. Uh, but it does give a concession, a couple of concessions in allowing the marriage of Protestant clergy because that's one thing that, that uh, the Protestant Reformation it was about is that some of the clergy that were running these churches had adopted Lutheranism or other forms of Protestant Christianity, which accepted the idea that a clergy of uh, somebody, uh, uh, some official in the church could actually be married. And this is typical of Protestants. And so they're already married. So Charles is saying, okay, you don't have to divorce your wife that you already have, or somehow, you know, how would that sort out? So he's um, acquiescing to that. And he also uh, says that it's okay to have the Eucharist in both kinds for the laity, instead of just having in a Roman Catholic service where the priest drinks from the cup of wine, but the 
the people, the regular parishioners come up and accept, uh, you know, the body of Christ, the bread, but don't drink from, from the wine. Uh, in Protestant um, churches at this time, in Lutheran churches, who were, you know, church, Catholics who converted to a different version of Catholicism. They just thought they were just changing Catholicism. And they, one of the tweaks that they made is that they, they, um, they all drank from the wine and all drank, and all ate from the bread. Um, and hopefully that makes sense that you have enough experience with Christianity to know what that means. Um, but that is in um, the selections from the Book of Mark that I gave you. Um, the Last Supper is the the biblical narrative of Jesus's life that the Eucharist, the sacrament of taking the bread and taking the, the wine uh, is derived from. And then, it, and then Jesus says in that passage of, of the New Testament and it's in the other four gospels as well, or the other three, um, he says, you know, uh, the, the bread, take the bread, this is my body and drink of the wine, this is my blood which will then be his body and blood in the crucifixion scene uh, that he is preparing them for. Uh, okay, and then there's, uh, so Charles thinks that this Augsburg interim is a way of making peace. It's a peace offering. It doesn't fly. There's a second revolt um, from a, a, a different group of princes, a smaller group of princes who uh, formed the Treaty of, of Torgau uh, in 1551, um, up in the northern portion, which you know has had a little bit more success in fighting off the imperial forces. Um, and they coordinate with Henry II of France, who's in the process of starting a war with the Holy Roman Empire, um, fighting over Italy primarily, so uh, realms in Italy, um, but also along the Rhine, the river that runs between France and the Holy Roman Empire, or today between France and Germany. A lot of the border between France and Germany is established by the Rhine River, which is a, which is a large river. Uh, and Henry, uh, at the beginning of the Second Revolt, is invading across the Rhine, and the Protestant uh, rebels are, are using, you know, that as, as a uh, as part of their overall strategy. So they're strategically using that. And um, the Protestant princes throughout the Holy Roman Empire jump on board, they present a united front and they win this uh, revolt. Uh, there is a peace in which, you know, uh, Charles is not defeated in the sense that he gives up his emperorship or anything like that, uh, but, um, it's very uh, conciliatory towards the Protestant princes. Um, the Augsburg interim is revolt, uh, revoked, so it's no longer, uh, you know, he's not trying to force them to have Catholic ideas. Um, princes that were imprisoned in the first revolt were released, so they got back their prisoners, uh, which was very important as part of the reason why they went uh, to war in this case in the first place. And, uh, but it is presented as just a temporary peace until the next diet in, in 1555. Okay. Um, and then in 1555, they come to the settlement of Augsburg and it has three main points. Whose realm, his religion. So whoever is the prince of a particular um, fiefdom, Whatever he chooses as the religion is the really, and everybody has to conform to that. So, uh, within each fiefdom, the Lord has the say. They get to choose. Okay, and um, there is an ecclesiastical reservation, so that, you know, because some of the lords of a fiefdom might be uh, part of the Roman Catholic Church, or 
maybe part of the Lutheran Church, but we're primarily concerned about the Roman Catholic Church at this point. Uh, if it's a papal, you know, something, a, a fiefdom that's ultimately held by the Pope, you know, a local bishop can't decide to go Protestant, is, you know, is what this is saying, um, you know, because that would cause more trouble that that would that would blow up uh, in their face that that makes sense um and then uh ferdinand is uh charles's brother ferdinand's declaration his and he he was quite significant in negotiating with the protestant princes you know he was effective at being diplomatic and and trying to hold things together um his declaration is that knights are exempted. They can choose to practice any way they want. Um, so their vassal lord couldn't dictate to them. So a knight with a smaller fiefdom uh, could decide for their fiefdom. Um, and, and again, this is that where the knights are not, they're not on the same level as nobles. They're, they're, they're at this lower level. And this is part of, you know, the whole controversy here is that knights are, are feeling like they're becoming obsolete, which they are. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then also towns where you might have a town within a larger fiefdom that is Catholic, but in the town they're Protestants, which is the typical way. It could go whatever way, but, but this is the typical sort of scenario is in the towns, they tended to be more Protestant, but they might be within the fiefdom of a Lord who is Catholic. And even the peasants out in the countryside are, are largely Catholic. Um, this would mean that the Lord could impose Roman Catholicism in the countryside, but in the town, the townspeople would be free. And, and of course, um, that again is to keep things from blowing up in their face. You know, if this has been going on, let's try not to go backwards. Let's just try to mellow things out and, and keep things status quo. Okay. Um, and then Charles uh, abdicates shortly afterwards. Um, He had already abdicated uh, Naples and Sicily and Italy to, to Philip, his son. So this is Philip of Spain. Um, and uh, he abdicates to Philip the 17 provinces of the Netherlands. Okay, and so these 17 and provinces of the Netherlands are really crucial to the story uh, that I wanna focus on later on in the series of lectures. Okay, and uh, he abdicates the Spanish empire to Philip. So now Philip is king of Spain and he abdicates the Holy Roman empire to his brother Ferdinand, who I just mentioned earlier. And then uh, he retires to the monastery and dies shortly thereafter. So he was sick during this entire period of abdication. Uh, you know, perhaps he abdicated because of the defeat in the Protestant Reformation. That might have had something to do with it, but he obviously was sick and dying. So um, he, he bows out uh, rather than hanging on to power. Okay, so, uh, so that's, that's good for that section. So I'm gonna stop the video here.